Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Getting Personal with Parkinson's, a Facebook Live conversation series. I'm Whitney Chapman. I am the Programming and Production Coordinator for the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan's Edmund J. Safra Parkinson's Wellness Program, supported by New York's largest healthcare provider, Northwell Health. I'm proud to say that for over 15 years, the JCC has been hosting programs for individuals living with Parkinson's. And you can find these programs on our website at www.mmjccm.org forward slash Parkinson's. And you can see the link below in our comments section. For those of you who are joining me for the first time, welcome. Great to have you here. This program is for anyone whose life has been impacted by Parkinson's those who are diagnosed, as well as family and friends or individuals who are just curious to learn more. We want these conversations to help put a face to Parkinson's and to introduce you to people who are living and thriving with PD. We welcome your input. If you have comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And if you wanna be a guest to tell your story or you know of a topic or someone we should interview, please let me know. You can reach me by email at W Chapman at mmjccm.org. And again, we'll put that information in the comment section below. Before we get started, however, I have a favor to ask. Can you please click the share button that's just below this video screen on your computer and let others know that you're watching today? This helps us share the information that you're going to hear as well as help promote our programs. I'd be really grateful if you can do that. Now, let me introduce to you Michael Baird. I had a wonderful conversation with him recently. Michael is a former radi radiology oncologist who discovered he had Parkinson's. And this conversation was an interesting uh, journey into how being a doctor has helped him now as a patient. We pre-recorded this conversation, which I will share with you now, and then I'll be back afterwards to answer any questions you may have. So as you watch, please be sure to put your questions or comments in the comments section below. I'll see you soon. Mike, welcome to Getting Personal with Parkinson's. It's lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm glad you called. Well, I'm glad you were willing to have this conversation sure. with me. So tell me, how did you discover you had Parkinson's? Well, that's, that's very strange. The, I'll tell you that medically, you don't know that you lost the serotonin or the uh, L-dopa, you know, the dopamine-creating neurons until you're down to about 20% of them, so that the disease goes on for a long time. You have to lose 80% of the cells in your brain before you even feel that it's happening. So looking back, I think most Parkinson's patients, myself included, can say, oh yeah, I got diagnosed there, but a year ago I was doing things that I didn't ever do before. So I used to bike ride. I used to ride about seven, 8,000 miles a, a year on long distance bike rides. And one day, uh, about a year before I was diagnosed, I was riding with my wife on, in, the, in the park, going about five miles an hour, and I, my tire got hooked on the side of the road. I flipped over and I fractured, dislocated my left arm. Now, looking back on it, and even at the time, I said, now, how did that happen? Because I go up hills and I ride mountain bikes. I've never had a fall like that on a flat pad going five miles an hour. I mean, it made no sense. Anyway, I think that was an early indication of a little loss of my stability which just gradually was getting worse, but it was happening so slowly, I wasn't aware of it. Fast forward a year later, we were on a walk uh, in Spain, where we were walking this uh, to you know, this ancient walk uh, through Northern Spain. My wife and my friends were uh, walking behind me and they noticed that I was not moving my right arm and that I was kind of bent over to the right side. Now, I didn't realize that at all. In fact, they had to take a picture of me. I still have that picture. Uh, to show me how bad it looked because I didn't believe it. So I saw a neurologist in town. Now, this is right about the time I was retiring. And um, he says, I think you've got Parkinson's. But we were moving to New York, so we leaving California. So I said, well, that's nice. Came back to New York, and I saw two 
big time Parkinson specialists, both of whom agreed that I had Parkinson. I still didn't think I had anything wrong with me. And I was doing pretty, pretty good. I just, I, you know, I told people I had Parkinson's, but I had a few little things that were a little bit too much saliva, so I dribbled a little bit here. I have a tremor at night. But then I noticed that I was just getting slower. Just everything about me was just slowing down. So at that point, I became a little concerned, went back. I saw the, the, the Parkinson's specialist every six months. And they kept checking me and saying, no, nah, you're pretty much the same. Your exam is pretty much the same. We're going to leave you alone. Now, let's fast forward to 2020, which is about five years after my diagnosis, five or six years after my diagnosis. I'm sitting there, and we have a place in the Buna Woods in, in California where we go during the winter and, and sometimes during the summer. And I was doing the dishes and suddenly got severe pains in my right leg. So I went to the emergency room to get checked out. They couldn't find anything specific. They sent me for an MRI. And the way the MRI, my leg went out and I fell. Make a long story short, I had what they call spinal stenosis. And it was a critical situation pressing on the nerves. I ended up getting spinal surgery and was in bed for maybe four to six weeks. Really, really in pain and getting over that. Now, during that time, the Parkinson's got a whole lot worse. Now, I don't know whether it's because I went from a life of, life of a fair amount of activity to zero laying in bed, or whether the stress of the surgery had something to do with it, or if it was just slowly getting worse and I just wasn't aware of it. But as I recovered from the surgery, I began to experience more problems from the Parkinson's. The slowness was really getting bad, and I was having trouble doing my trousers and doing activities of daily living kind of stuff. Uh, there's still not much tremor. I don't really have much tremor, never did. But it's just what they call bradykinesia, slowness of thought and, and things working. I mean, I go to pick up a towel and I have to say, okay, raise your right arm. Now reach for the towel. Now close your hand. It wouldn't wasn't automatic to just do that. I had to think about each step. I remember Michael J. Fox once said it took him an hour to get dressed in the morning. And that's kind of the way it was going for me. So I went back to see the 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 uh Parkinson's talk, and she said, well, yeah, you know, you do need to have more medicine, so they doubled my cinnamon. Within six to 12 hours, I was almost back to where I was before in terms of being good. I mean, it was amazing. So what had happened is over those six years that I was on the sleep dose of cinnamon, I was getting slowly worse, but I didn't realize it. I probably should have had some dose changes along the way, but it was very subtle and nobody picked it up. Until finally I had this. And so whether the surgery, that was also that when COVID came and we were in lockdown and I ended up catching COVID. So it, was, it was kind of complicated. So what threw me down? But now I'm, I'm pretty much back to the way I was before. But I'm on twice the dose of cinnamon. I'm in pretty good shape. But I have a feeling that if I turn my back and ignore it, I'm going to be in trouble. I take pills every couple of four hours. And I can tell there's this thing called on and off symptoms. I never had that before recently, but in the last few years now, if I go more than four hours without taking pills, I start to slow down and get a little grouchy and have more trouble doing things. So I have my watch set for every four hours and it goes off. And well, I can say I'm getting along well right now. I'm not as good as I was six years ago because I didn't have to manage it. I was as well. But now with keeping my eye on it, I... I'm well, you have have downloaded a lot of really important information and I want to go back a little bit um, uh, on a couple of things. First of all, I want to let those who are watching this interview today know that you are also a medical doctor. Um, yeah. And um, so you're, when you started talking initially about the dopamine level and I don't know that I even knew that it takes to get to about 20% before it really shows up. That was a really important um, piece of information. And you also mentioned the, uh, at one point you were having to think about lifting my arm to reach down to grab the towel and how certain tasks of daily life that you didn't think about before that were automatic suddenly now require concentration and thought. And um, I have been teaching in our Parkinson's community for uh, about 15 years. And I have seen 
what you have described um, in my students and, and we deal with a lot of strategies to be reminded that you have to think about things because the synapsis in the brain to the muscles is not working in the way it used to, which is why we have to stop and think and find alternative strategies. Um, and, you, and then in addition, you also mentioned the need to stay on top of it and strategies like setting your alarm so that you know every four hours you need to um, take your medication so that you can stay in a more steady state, in a more manageable state. Um, that's, those are great tips, especially for someone who is new to managing their disease, um, who is new to living with Parkinson's. Um, so I kind of want to ask you, where does your medical training come in as a tool for you in living with Parkinson's? Well, you know, first of all, having dealt with cancer, which is what I did my whole life, um, I was actually happy that I had Parkinson's and not cancer because I, I knew that Parkinson's is a chronic disease, but it is not rapidly debilitating like cancer can be and usually not fatal like, like cancer is. Parkinson's is not like that. It's a linear disease. If it took six years for you to double your medicines, it'll probably take another six years to you have to double it again. So that made me feel very good because I'm already old enough that in another six years, I'll be in my 80s. And at that point, I'm going to be doing a whole lot anyway. There's a lot more time to live with the disease than something that's going very rapidly. Because that was helpful. And the other thing that, that, that's really helped me is I've learned to observe myself in ways that help the doctors and physical therapists. The last physical therapist that I went to see, I've been still seeing him now. He's got his doctorate in physical therapy. And uh, and when I first came in, I started to describe it. He says, you're a doctor, aren't you? He says, I said, yeah, how do you know? He said, well, because you're telling me things that patients never tell me. You're never aware of these things. So you're giving me all these details, which really help me decide what's going wrong with you. It just tells me that if you're a patient, the more you can observe of what's going on with you, the more you're going to help your people that are taking care of you understand what's going on. I think the thing that I've learned in talking to the other guys in our groups, you see a doctor for 15 minutes, maybe a half an hour if you're lucky. They do a few mumbo jumbo things and feel around here and do that, but they really don't have a great feel for what's going on with you. They got a kind of a good feel, but not a great feel. You're living with yourself 24 hours a day. So the more you can express to them what it's like, the more they're going to be able to help you. You're one of these naysayers. Like I used to have patients who like to make me feel good and tell me everything was fine. And they go home and I get a phone call from their family saying, did he tell you this? No. Did he tell you that? No. Why did he do that? Well, he didn't want to make you feel bad. You know, I mean, you don't, it's not a matter of making your doctor feel bad. It's a matter of giving your doctor the, the information they need to help you. So you want to be as honest as you can, but as open as you can. And tell them everything, everything, even if even if you're embarrassed by it, you think it's not nothing. You know, I went to the bathroom the other day and I missed my rear end. You know, that may mean nothing to you, but it may mean a whole lot to them. So, I mean, the more detailed you can be and the more observant of yourself you can be, the better off you can be. And I think that really we've got a couple of guys in our group who are uh, hooked on their Parkinson's. That's all they think about. They read every article that comes out. They look at every study that's gone out. They go from one magical cure to the next magical cure. And I've learned that in my my practice in cancer, the same thing. Patients would get obsessed with it, and looking for the magic bullet, and then they end up losing losing the good time that they have because they're always looking for something better. I was always to say, you know, when you're going around with America, around with life, you can reach for that that brass ring to, that gives you an extra round, but if you reach too far, you fall off the horse, it didn't do you any good. So you want to stay on the horse. You want to you want to keep your eyes open, but you don't want to get so obsessed by it that you stop living. Living is the most important thing. And living a, a good life. I think that is so true. And um, one of the components of the Parkinson's Wellness Program here at the JCC is we call it a wellness program because we want to empower people to live their best life. And yes, you have Parkinson's, but you also have a life that is not just Parkinson's. You know, Parkinson's might uh, influence how you maneuver through the world, 
um, choices that you have to make, but there's still a lot of life to be lived. Yeah, the honest with you is that I've spent more time looking for things that I can do well and getting better at it rather than trying to keep things that I used to do that I can't do well. It's better to know that you're on your own journey and look for your own path rather than get excited, get depressed because you can't do what he did or do, you know, you're going to have the things you can do that he can't do or she can't do. So you can have things that you can't do. And you just have to figure your own way out, not not to not to go with too many preconceived issues. I used to do a lot of computer artwork. Now, I, in addition to that, I've taken up this whole 3D thing. So I do 3D animations, 2D animations. I have a here's a little model that I made of my my one of my granddaughters she's taking her first steps, you know, print them out and paint them up, and she give them to the kids and. They, you know, make them all chess sets with themselves, with the pieces and stuff like that. It's, it's nonsensical stuff, but it keeps me busy, and it and I enjoy it. I enjoy learning about it. I enjoy doing it, and uh, you know, I just found things that I can do that I enjoy doing, and uh, forget about the fact that I used to enjoy other things I can't do. Art and artistic endeavors, music, theater, um, they work the brain differently. And, um, you know, your skill sets may change. I, I have never seen a 3D chess set like that someone made. I mean, like, how cool Here, would that be for your family to have? I'll show up. Hang on. My grandson is six is now into basketball. So, and then what's amazing is the cost of these things. Like I was saying, they used to cost six, seven thousand dollars for these units. This thing costs 250 bucks. I think it's especially like 60 cents to make, you know. So you can make a lot of them throw them out because you get some that don't work. <laughs> but it's fun. Um, you got involved, I'm told, with the boxing for PD. How did that come about? And what did you gain or what have you learned from participating in that? Well, what, what everybody told me, everything I read and everybody told me is that the one thing that has been shown to slow the progression of Parkinson's, the only thing that's definitively been shown to slow the progression of Parkinson's is exercise. So an intense exercise is more important than minor exercise. So when I got to Brooklyn, again, that's right when I saw these other guys and finally admitted I had the diagnosis, although I had still had strong reservations about that. I, I found Alex in the boxing program at Nick Lisa's gym and spent about a year, year and a half going there, three days a week, boxing and, and Alex had a very intense program and it almost killed us. But I tell you, I, I, not only did I feel better for Parkinson's, I was in the best shape I've been since I was 14 years old. Now, you were also involved, am I correct, in a theater program that Alex was teaching? Well, that was that was interesting. They had a, they had a um, theater group uh, when I was doing the boxing that I was not involved with. It put on a play. Right. Um, and we, of course, we all went to the play and everybody enjoyed it and everything else. And then afterwards, they said, well, we're going to do it again. And that's about the time when COVID came. And because of the, the COVID thing, they, they made the um, theater group into a uh, creative writing group. So basically, the, the theater group people would meet with us and we'd give us, you know, do write poetry, we write this, we write that. You know, we got all these stories. What are we going to do with them? Somebody... I don't remember who said, well, yeah, we'll put it together and we can write a play. So we decided we would take our, our stories and write a play. So we took some of the stuff we had written as well as some new stuff and just started freelancing a play, which took place, took about, I'd say a good six months to, to really come together. And so then it's a Zoom play because then when, after we had a script and the play, we started practicing it and they gave us uh theater, you know, how to emote and how to speak properly and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it wasn't as good as being there in person, but it's as good as it could be. And then we would we, we practice the play and they would tape it and then we would have our, you know, our, our sessions where we purposefully try to do the best we could. And, and then, uh, then they've been putting it together and now I think we've got it all finished. They're doing the final editing, and, and then I did uh, some uh, animations for in between the scenes. And 
So this thing is going to come out. Um, I think next Monday we see the first run of the final draft. We've seen, we've seen, and so That's it's exciting. It, yeah, and then on the twenty first, I think we're all coming together physically for the very first time to uh, NYU get our rights with our wives and and, and spouses and you know, all that other stuff. And uh, we're going to have a meeting, and we're going to officially unveil the. the, the and we're going to use it, you know, make it available where people want to see it. But it talks of good, it's about a bus ride of a bunch of people with Parkinson's. It's, it's fun, you know, it's it's a fun thing. It's a fun story. Uh, it's got a little bit of Parkinson's in it. It's got a little bit of life in it. It's got a little bit of social commentary. A little bit by a lot of what has Parkinson's taught you? Well, you know, what hasn't it taught me? I mean, it's made me reconfigure my whole life. Um, yeah, patients always used to come up and say, oh, you know, cancer's been a bad, horrible thing in our lives and everything, but it's kind of a silver lining. I've got a lot of the blessings out of it. And I always go, oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's good. That, that's a means that they were having a better time than I would have. But I never knew what they were talking about because I never had a chronic illness before. And then when I got this thing, I began to realize, you know, now I see what they were talking about. You you do change your, your view of the world. Um, when you know that tomorrow may not be as good as today, then you kind of makes today a little bit more special than just another day. For me, I appreciate what I'm doing more. I spend more time trying to do what's what I think is right for me and for others. But more important, try to live in the moment rather than put things off because first of all, I don't know what kind of shape I'm gonna be in when I put things off. But more importantly, I want, to, I want to get most out of my life. I don't think how long you live is terribly important. I think what's more important is how well you live and truthfully how you die. I mean, uh, if you can die surrounded by people that love you and take care of you, that's wonderful. You can be there. I mean, I've seen in my practice, I would have two patients in the room. One was dirt poor farmer. The other is a guy that owns a whole lot of stuff. The guy holds a lot of stuff and very good sit in the bed by himself. And the dirt your park uh, farmer would have family member after family member after friend come. There's always somebody in the room talking to him. And I'd often walk in and I'd say, now who's the who's the rich guy in this of these two, you know? Not the guy that's got all the money and nobody visits him, but the guy that's got all the people that care about him and show up. And I think that I'm seeing more and more of that myself. I'm beginning to realize that. But you know, Parkinson's has given me a lot. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not saying everybody should run out and get Parkinson's. I think that's wrong. But I think that the perspective of having to deal with something that's outside your control—that the future is a little distinct and the cat is cute—is is not. Uh, not there and she's agreeing with you she doesn't come on screen much so the fact that she's agreeing with you is good well that's the other thing you know i got a dog so we always had a dog but we were traveling around a lot and we didn't have a dog and so i said you know i want a little dog and i got that when i was really feeling down with all his back surgeries and his little puppy and me and him have become great friends so i think having a little pet of some sort is a, is a big help in this situation too well, you really moved me, and she doesn't move a lot, does not come on screen um, almost ever when I'm doing these interviews. So this is a rarity, but she's also purring. And she only does that when something has really touched me. And I have to say that your conversation and, and the gratitude that you are discovering um, in how to manage your Parkinson's and what it has shown you and how it has changed your value, um, or I won't say changed your values, but how it has um, clarified. Clarified, exactly. Um, that's impressive. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. And you know, when, they, when I talk to the other guys, that's what we usually, especially when they're depressed, talk enough about it and then eventually they'll come around and say, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was. I mean, I have to point it out to them. And uh, it's been one thing that I think I've been able to help some people with. And it, this has been an extraordinary conversation. And I just want to kind of open the floor to you and say, is there anything else or any advice 
that you want to share with someone, especially if they're newly diagnosed? Well, one of the things I, Alex was, was talking and, and, and I were talking about uh, doing a, uh, a program for shut-ins. And that didn't go anywhere, I don't think. He just got too busy doing other things. But I'd like to talk to you about that in terms of, I think that socialization is very important. And I see an awful lot of people that sit in a room by themselves and don't have somebody. And I think we as a community ought to reach out to those people and figure out a way to get them iPads and, or some tablet things and have programs designed for them to you know, talk to each other and talk to us. Because I think that, that opening up and sharing is, is the most important thing you can do in all of this. And I, I, I just see too many people living in isolation. This is why we're having this conversation, is to share your story and um, to be insightful. And when I have shared these conversations, the recordings that will eventually live on our YouTube channel playlist, um, people appreciate being able to hear someone else's story. And yours might be different than the next person's, but there are certain things that are common threads. Like in positive psychology, we learn about a, a technique that actually comes from theater that's it's called yes and. And it's yes, I have Parkinson's and I have a life, right? And this conversation has been loaded in my opinion with wonderful ideas and tips and um, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. No, it's no problem. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And I will, uh, I want you to know that I did hear your um, call to arms or challenge, if you were, or invitation for us to find ways to continue to outreach to the Parkinson's community, especially those that are isolated. Um, the reason we started this Parkinson's program at the JCC was that we wanted it to be in a community and Dr. DeRocco, who's our medical advisor, really felt that if people were around other people, that would be a tool and um, a help both consciously and unconsciously. You know, when you can talk to, you mentioned your, your buddies, your guys, that, you know, when you can share your own stories with other people and you and you network in ways right. that are kind of non-traditional or you, you know, complain to each other for a while until someone says, okay, let's move on, um, that's invaluable. And we all need that in life. And unfortunately, Parkinson's, we know, um, has a propensity for uh, isolation and um, depression. And I want and especially the people that are by themselves that don't have a huge support system, you know. Yeah. So I hear you, and I will. Um, and feel free to call me. I'm happy to work with it, with you on it. You got it. You got it. Okay. Michael, thank you so much for today. Okay. It's a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Wow. I don't know about you, but I was completely uplifted by Michael's ability to be proactive, to move forward, and his curiosity to keep learning. Um, I was inspired by his comments about how to look for things that you can be successful at now versus regretting things that you may not be able to do in the ways that you used to. I think that's great advice for all of us who are aging. Um, I also took away the comments about really taking notes about when you notice changes happening in your life um, as a way to empower you and your doctor when you're having your uh, conversations and your appointments. And like I said, I think those are great advices for all of us to take into consideration, whether we have Parkinson's or not, about helping us have the best life we can live. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation today, I really wanna ask you to help us share and spread the word by clicking that share button at the bottom of your screen. This helps us um, make the experience of Parkinson's a little less isolating by letting others know that programs like this and other offerings that both we at the JCC provide as well as well as other institutions to help make it less isolating and to know that you're not alone. We really want to empower you um, and help you. So if you know someone who would be interested in learning more about our programs, um, please let us know. We have an intake form and I'll put the link to that form below in our comments section that we ask you to complete. You can visit our website and you can contact me directly. Um, please know that you are not alone in this journey 
and we want to be there for you and to help you live the best life you can live. In the meantime, I want to wish you um, a good afternoon. If you're somewhere where it's as hot, please drink water and stay hydrated. We'll be back next month on September 12th for our next, next episode of Getting Personal with Parkinson's. So in the meantime, enjoy your summer, and I look forward to seeing you next month. Have a great day.